This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. Several years ago, Penn Allen inherited a collection of diaries that had been meticulously maintained by her great-grandmother. Penn discovered the diaries documented the building of her great-grandmother and grandfather's arts and crafts house, and the development of the garden that followed. She uncovered an untold story of her family, of plant hunting and of rock gardens, one that has significance to the wider world of horticultural history, and in fact, goes some way to rewriting it. Okay, well, I'm retired, sort of, except that I write and garden very passionately. And the book came about because I'd inherited quite a long time ago, a collection of diaries that had belonged to my great grandmother. And they gathered dust for a number of years before I fished one out on a wet afternoon and started reading it. And that basically sort of fired me with excitement is is all I can say, because I, I realized as I got used to her handwriting and started wading through them, there's about 25 years worth of them, that she tells the story of the building of her and her husband's arts and crafts house and their ensuing development of the garden. And she also sort of brings herself to life in the diaries. And I felt that I was getting to know not a sort of Victorian lady in a frilly hat, but a passionate living person who had a really love affair for her husband and her family and her environment and the garden that they began to develop together. And that was really what sort of set me off on the pursuing the story. And then more recently, my siblings and I had inherited a collection of letters when an, an aunt died. And this prompted me to to investigate those. And really I couldn't couldn't believe my eyes when <laughs> when I started to read through them, mainly from Reginald Farrer and Will Purden, plant hunters, to my great grandfather. They document well, they document several things. They document the friendship that Will Purdom had with my great-grandfather and the input that he, he had into the garden at White Crags. They also document how my great-grandfather came to be involved in sponsoring Will's uh, second expedition to China, where, which he went on with Reginald Farrer. And they they bring to life again a friendship, really, that is not documented anywhere else. Um, and I just really sort of began to realise the importance of it all and felt that I'd got to pull it together and make a story out of it. Yes, and I'm very glad that you did, because I, for one, loved the book. And I don't want to give too much away. That's my main thing, actually, from the outset of the interview. I kind of thought to myself reading the book, you know, you build the story so well that I don't want to go kind of too much into detail. So speaking more in sort of generalities, can you tell me about, to start with the house, but also the garden and how it developed around the house? Yes. Well, the house was designed by arts and crafts architect Dan Gibson, who rather like Will Purdom, died young and is poorly documented. Um, He designed several very notable arts and crafts houses, um, quite a few of them in and around Cumbria. Um, He was also in partnership for a while with Thomas Mawson. By the time White Crags was built, Mawson and Gibson weren't any longer in, in partnership together. But it is noted that they, you know, when Gibson was designing a house, he would still consult Mawson as to how the garden might sit around it. And the formal part of the garden, which is in front of the house, very much echoes Mawson's designs. 
so that was that was sort of designed and put in soon after the house was built and then the rock as it's known was developed some years later and that was that was the part of the garden that will purdom had most input into mm. and that bit i believe was also influenced much more by your family as well by their design input and also by the plants that they came across yes that and also by fashion i think because at that time we're talking early 1900s uh, rock gardens were all the rage and also you know p plant hunting was absolutely at its zenith and everybody wanted you know the latest novelty the newest newest unseen from furthest afield so it was very much sort of on trend the rock garden but the location also up on a sort of high rocky crag on the side of Luffrig Fell overlooking Windermere just lent itself to be developed in that way um, and I think also there was input in a sense from my great grandmother who like a lot of women at that time I mean, they were friends and neighbours, for instance, with Beatrix Potter, you know, the the Armit sisters, all, all sort of notable botanists in their day. And my great grandmother had a passion akin to that a knowledge of local flora and fauna. And, you know, I think this inspired them to sort of develop that part of the garden in a very sympathetic more naturalised way, shall we say. I mean, it was almost the perfect storm then because apart from being close friends with Will Purdom, and that came about through the gardener that was employed, I believe, but also the fact that the aspect of the garden was so perfect for growing those types of plants. I mean, do you get the sense that, you know, their garden was almost a test site for some of the plants that were being brought back? And that must have been important at the time for the people who were sending the plants back or the seeds back, because they must have had to have these places where they could trial the plants and have them propagated. Do you think that the garden played quite an important role in that sense? Very much so, yes. And Will Purdom does say in one of his letters to my great-grandfather that the more gardens the seeds are spread about in the locality, the more chance that they will have of having some success and working out, you know, how, how well a plant may go or where it would like best. And I think Will also gave my great grandfather in one of his letters he says don't 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 let it be known that i'm i'm giving you these seeds because they're not in cultivation yet but i think he very much used his close friend as a bit of a sort of test site i do include a list in the book of the seeds that will gave on a very personal level to my great grandfather that the two of them got going together um, in the garden at White Crags that came from Will's first solo expedition. I haven't included all the plant finds from Will and Farah's second ex expedition because I think there are other places and other people who've done that perhaps better than I could have done. But very much, I think, you know, my great grandfather was a trusted and close friend of Will Purdom's, and I think he did use the garden at White Crags as something of a, a sort of trial. He had free reign there, and you know he made the most of it. Mm. Yeah, which is a testament as well to the gardening skills of your great grandfather and you know his daughters as well. Well, I think my great grandfather owed his gardening skills to my great grandmother. And that also was sort of another part of the inspiration for the for the story, if you like, because I think he was probably a fairly scientific, Victorian, upstanding sort of a fellow. And I think she taught him how to love and how to love the place that he was in. And that in turn taught him, I think, how to develop the garden and his friendship 
with Will gave him a sort of the other side of gardening, if you like, the slightly more scientific aspect of it, how to cultivate, how to prepare your ground, irrigation, you know, how to propagate, all these sort of things. I think that Will, he was he was fascinated by that side of it. And the two parts, as most gardeners know, you need you need a bit of both, don't you? Yeah, and I do wonder, again, not going into it in any detail, but I wonder if he found that side of it more so when he needed the garden as a place of healing, which it seemed to have been to actually a number of people who were using it. And it made me think about how that garden became a place where people found solace. And I wondered, you know, was it the kind of fact that they were using it as a space to contemplate or a space to communicate with each other? Because again, it was it seemed like an almost an informal arena in which to have a conversation or, you know, was it a distraction or was it all those things? Did you get the sense of that as you were reading the diaries? I think it was all those things. I think it sort of started off probably as none of those things except perhaps for my great-grandmother. But I think over time, and as you say, without giving too much of the story away, I think my great-grandfather's emotional connection to the place allowed him to develop such a profound friendship with Will Purdom and, and with the garden. And, you know, together, the two of them found something that neither of them had been able to find anywhere else. Nicola Shulman's beautiful book, A Rage for Rock Gardening, she mentions when she's talking about Farrer and Purdom's joint expedition to China, she says how much Farrer loved Purdom. But uh, can I read you a little quote? Have I got two seconds? It's half a line. She says, Farrer loved Purdom and depended entirely upon him. What Purdom thought of Farrah, or any of it, we shall never know, as no letters of his from this time exist, and the whole account of their journey is from Farrah's side. But the thing is, here, in my book, Purdom tells his side. Uh, you know, it's a glimpse into him that nobody's known existed before, and that, I think, is what makes what could be a very personal family story into a story that's got national and probably international importance. Well, I mean, it has because it just shows you how the story can be so completely polar opposite, you know, from one person's account to the next person's. And so to get that balance is fantastic. And, you know, it really is a piece in the jigsaw puzzle that otherwise would have gone completely unknown. I think with Will... You said you felt quite compelled to write the story. And Will, I think, from reading it, I get the sense that he's a little bit of an underdog, maybe because of his background, maybe because of the fact that he was young and quite outspoken and passionate about his plants and everything. So it's really, really good to put his side of the story forward because he was maybe not on Farrah's social standing. So to tell his story is fantastic. Can you give a little bit of an insight into how his account differs very much from Reginald Farrah's? Well, for anybody who follows these plant hunters, Farrow was such a colourful chap. He had a, a, a sort of very mixed reputation in as much as he is acknowledged to have been a, a, an absolute authority on alpines, rock plants. Uh, his garden writing is hugely respected, but he was a bit of a nutcase. <laughs> and Purdom was not credited when they set off on their joint expedition together. It was really Purdom's experience from his first solo expedition that armed the pair of them. Purdom went off ahead of Farrah to get everything ready. It was all Purdom's contacts from his first solo expedition that were renewed, that they used. And really the only accounts that had existed until these letters came to light of that expedition where Farrow's, he had the two volumes that he wrote about that expedition. And I feel that Purdom was undercredited in his life for his contribution. His first expedition wasn't very highly rated 
for various reasons. And his second one was so overshadowed by the sort of reputation and colour of Farah. And Purdom, who was quite, you know, he was not a chap who wanted to be in the limelight, but I feel that he's never really received his full day in the sun, if you like. He's never really received what was his due because Farah was such a large character. And so many of the plants that they brought back on their second expedition, I think Farah sort of rather graciously allowed one or two of them to be classified with Purdom's name, but the vast majority of them were classified Farrari. And I'd like Purdom to have a little bit of recognition. I think he was a really lovely man. And these letters that he wrote to my great-grandfather show how tricky he found Farrah and that it wasn't all plain sailing for him. Yeah, that is quite an understated way of putting it. I mean, so at some point. Well, I'm trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, I think the interesting thing about Farrah, obviously, as you said, is that he, he was a very colourful character and there were various letters from various people that corroborated that opinion that he could be tricky and flamboyant and uh, and everything else. So, yes, it's really good to get that side of history. And in terms of how the garden and the house developed, you know, what became of the garden after your great-grandparents weren't in charge of it anymore? Yes, well, it was a sorry end from my point of view. Um, it stayed in my family um, until the early 1980s. Uh, my uncle, as as after the death of my great-grandfather, my grandmother and her sisters stayed on in the house and my uncle and his wife went back and tended the garden it stayed open it was open to the public i think from 1929 or thereabouts and it stayed open to the public almost until it was sold and since then very sadly the property's been divided up the house still exists but has been made into apartments the garden has been divided up. Um, it's now now three properties. Although the rock exists and still rests with the main house, the last time I saw it, which was a few years ago, it it was it was in a sad state. Really, it's, it's very sad. But you know, life moves on, doesn't it? And I think also that was another driving force for me because if the evidence the physical evidence the house and garden don't exist as they used to then the story is even more important isn't it absolutely it is and it's lovely that you have documented it and in order to get to know the characters in the story obviously you had the diaries and it's really interesting how you've written the book and you do include the letters at the end of it that you've kind of drawn on for source material. Was there anybody living who had a connection to the characters that were in the book as well that you spoke to? Not to my great grandparents, because obviously they're of a time that's gone. I did meet people who remember the house and garden in its heyday, which was sort of... 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s, when it was very, very well known in the locality. And I I have since the book's been published, I've had a couple of lovely letters from people who say that they have wonderful memories of visiting the garden in its heyday. It used to, apart, apart from all the alpines and rock plants, it was famed for its azaleas and rhododendrons and you know was was a riot i think of color and activity so i've i've met people who've known it from that time and obviously my memories uh, you know i have many many wonderful memories i consider myself privileged to have known it when it was one and private and just in its heyday very many thanks to pem for sharing this story and thank you to you as well for listening this week's shout out for a good person doing good work goes to Sam Taylor Hunt, who runs Modica Gardens in Cheltenham. I met Sam when he was at college and I always had him pegged as someone who'd go on to great things, which he has. 
There's a link to his website in the show notes. Dr. Ian Bedford is up next, talking about an issue that came up on last week's chat with Dusty Gedge, and I'm hoping might come up again very soon. I'm sure that everyone who enjoys their garden will welcome the sight of butterflies fluttering amongst their flowers. Many of us would have planted specific plants for the butterflies, plants whose flowers produce copious amounts of nectar, which is the vital source of energy for these beautiful, delicate insects. One of the most well-known is Budlia, commonly known as the butterfly bush. And sure enough, Budlias are an excellent source of nectar, flowering throughout the summer months and an obvious magnet to butterflies. But have you ever noticed that despite many butterflies feeding on the Budlia, there's not actually many different species? Peacocks, small tortoiseshells, red admirals, painted ladies, commas and cabbage whites are frequent visitors. But where are the blues, the browns, the speckled woods, small coppers, ringlets and skippers? Well, there's actually a very simple answer. The corolla depth is the distance from the lip of a flower to its nectar source within. And this varies considerably between plant species. Budlias have a corolla depth of nine millimetres. Yet many of our butterfly species only have seven to eight millimetre long tongues which means they can't access the Budlia's nectar. It's only accessible to the long-tongued species, which are the ones that you'll see feeding on the Budlia flowers. So it's always worth planting some summer flowering plants that have short corolla depths and provide plenty of nectar for the short-tongued butterflies. Perennial wallflowers, Verbena benariensis and Helianthus, to name just a few. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All podcast.